So it's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. So this is Santiago Miraca from uh, Multiple Health. And we move quickly from Europe to now South America and a bit to Canada. And uh, Santiago is uh, over 20 years as a clinical cardiologist, um, heart failure and heart transplantation experience, as well as translational research in Argentina and Canada. Um, he runs one of the largest stem cell uh, research labs in Latin America, working on leading edge approaches to the use of applied AI, RNA sequencing, and other approaches to develop innovation for today's most important medical challenges. He's an AI enthusiast, and he carries on the, the torch that we were just talking about in terms of screening and cardiovascular health. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for invitation to CH Alliance. Uh, very happy to be here. And thanks, Maris, to introducing some of the topics uh, I'll be talking about in the next few minutes. So uh, I will uh, discuss a new actor in all this uh, uh, yeah, that we have heard in all these talks in the last few minutes, which is uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, together with uh, two other things we have discussed about uh, the importance of uh, genomic screening, sc uh, sorry, sc genomic screening in uh, FH disease. But also, I think it's important what's going to be happening in the next few years, which is uh, uh, data management, processing, and integration. How we collect data from our patients, how we transform that into usable uh, and actionable information. Uh, to improve uh, uh, disease and in particular to prevent that those dis diseases happen. Now, these two panels are uh, extremely interesting to me. Uh, they are part of uh, a revolution that is going on in the last few years. Uh, in the left panel, you can see that um, um, what has happened in the last 70 years uh, with the computational power and actually all, all those dots are algorithms and they represent on the y-axis the computational power expressed on flops that means units of computations per second and probably can be seen very well but uh, the latest AI models goes up to 10 to the 24th that's uh, extremely incredible computational power that's more grains of sun in the world right now so and this keeps going on and increasing and the uh, uh, on the right panel you can see what has happened in the last 20 years you can see that uh, to reach human level performance uh, at first with all these algorithms took us uh, a few years but in the last two years, it takes us just days to month. So this is incredible, and this really express the, uh, what is coming in the next probably decade. And together, and uh, pairing with that, we can see what has happened in the last 15, 20 years with, uh, uh, with the genomic world. These, are, uh, these data are from the NCBI. This is open source. There's no uh, data coming from uh, private companies here. Uh, and you can see that in, from 2020, there has a huge increase in the amount of uh, genomic information that has been deposited in the NCBI website. So, and it's probably related to uh, the change and improvement in the equipment and new technologies that are coming. So, the amount of inf information that we are really accruing right now in genomic is incredible. On the other hand, together with that, prices are coming down. Uh, right now, we can run uh, a whole genome analysis uh, right under $100. So probably in the next decade, we will see a dramatic, a dramatic improvement on these uh, numbers. And we will be able to run not only genomics, transcriptomics, but also all sorts of omics by just a bunch of dollars. So. We are in what I call the virtual circles of AI genomics right now, uh, based on these three facts, cost that are coming down very nicely, the computational power that we have right now, uh, based on all these uh, very powerful algorithms, and based on the incredible amount of data that we are generating. So 
what one of the problem is, I think, is the rate of adoption. Of course, AI is being used in at different levels in medicine. However, what's going on also is that this is just for generative AI. This represents, for example, the use of GPT in our clinical practices and so on. You can see that most most areas are adopting it very quickly. Of course, in medicine, as usual, uh, because of many, many factors, uh, even from ethicals to complexity, uh, it's not rapidly, rapidly being adopted. So there's something to do there. And our company has been working, uh, was funded three years ago, as Brady was saying, this is a spin-off from my lab, where we were having very interesting data on how to analyze our RNA sequencing that was coming from health, from, from cells. So we thought that it was, and it is probably the right time, uh, based on that revolution that I showed you, that uh, we can combine next generation sequencing, some data transformation and all the AI powerful algorithms that we are using right now to really uh, improve how we can detect uh, very early on the different diseases um, that uh, uh, that we need to treat. And actually, as a cardiologist, of course, I was interested in coronary artery disease. So we developed what we have called a digitalization of the blood. That means that we take a simple blood sample, uh, we sequence that, we sequence with RNA, uh, trying to raise all the information from the peripheral blood cells. Uh, we transform the data into uh, different ways, but one of the most powerful way has been to build that QR code that is in the center of the image. And with that, we um, feed uh, neural networks in order to make sense of the data that we have collected. With that, it's very interesting the amount of information that we can detect in the blood. Uh, instead of just measuring cholesterol levels, we're measuring uh, between 30 to 40,000 genes expressed in the peripheral blood. That's an incredible amount of information if we think that the human genome has 65,000 genes. So more than 50% of those are expressed in the blood. And each gene has different isoforms. On average, seven of them are uh, expressed in the peripheral blood. So it's incredible the amount of information. And actually, we went deep into the analysis and we can see that there's a huge number of exons are, are expressed there. So with all this information, uh, we start working with all these AI analysis, with all that bioinformatics analysis. And if you can see on the right side of the, uh, uh, of the figure, that if you go down in the complexity of the bioinformatic analysis, and if you go down in the complexity of your AI algorithms, you can have just as simple as a bunch of genes, a panel of genes analyzed by linear regression. That's not very powerful, but if you go to K-MIR concept, that means pieces of genes expressed in peripheral blood and go to large language models, probably you get a very, very powerful uh, way to analyze uh, the peripheral blood gene expression. Now, what we have seen, and it's very interesting, is that, of course, we are dealing with patients. So you can't collect uh, an unlimited number of samples from our patients. So there's probably, and you can see that on the, le on the right panel, that should be it's not working, let's see if it's working, but yeah, there you are. There's probably a green zone where we can work with, that is the right algorithm, the right um, bioinformatic tools, and the right number of patients. If not, of course, we would like to be like ChatGPT, be trained with all the Wikipedia web pages, but that's impossible. We can't collect all type of samples from everybody. So we need to focus and uh, and I think that the right spot will be reachable very soon. Now, we discussed this in the previous presentation. 18 million people die because of coronary artery disease. This is a really a huge problem for women, even more important than breast cancer, to tell the truth. And it's the number one reason of uh, health spending. And actually, this is our problem. And I'm a cardiologist, as Bladen was saying. And we are very good in uh, treating diseases, but we are very bad in detecting who is going to really have a heart attack. And this is uh, an example of that. Uh, Churchill, with all the 
non-cardiovascular risk factor managed to survive until the age of 91. And Mark is there, Mark is co-founder of uh, our company. And he had, unfortunately, a heart attack at the age of 35, even though he was a runner. So we can't properly identify who's going to have a heart attack and who's not. And what is interesting is that we, we have tools to prevent that. We have even from statins to uh, many, many tools to improve these if, again, we identify those patients. And one of the ways that has come up in the last uh, years was uh, the CT scan. Just by seeing the amount of calcium in the arteries, it's a very good way to know who is at risk of having a heart attack over the next decade. And this is a very clear example. If you have no calcium at all, your risk is around 0 0.25 a year. Um, now, if you have a serious calcium deposition in your arteries, that quadruples. So we, uh, and of course, one of the problems that we have is that we don't have enough CT scan. We don't have the ability to scan everybody you know, to identify that. And of course, you know, it's not, uh, it's not possible to implement that and to move every patient into downtown to have a CT scan. So this is data from one of our clinical studies. And you can see that uh, this um, is on the uh, x-axis is the chronic calcium score and the y-axis is uh, a cardiovascular risk score. You can see that actually we are not good at all in identifying who has calcium and who doesn't. And if we compare that uh, to the uh, cardiovascular risk uh, factors that those patients may have, we really misclassified around a third of our population. So our feeling as a physician when we are in front of a patient is really uh, very bad. We misjudge who really has and who doesn't have coronary artery disease. It's interesting, it's interesting to divide this into uh, the case, and you can see that the coronary artery disease really starts very early on. On people under the age of 40, you have already 17% of the population with coronary artery disease. So we need to identify them under the age of probably 40, 50 years old to start treatment, treating them and improving their, um, uh, their risk. I'm going to present uh, our first pilot clinical study very shortly. This was done in the last couple of years. And it was interesting. We collected patients from the community without any known uh, previous coronary artery disease. We performed a CT scan to measure the coronary calcium scores. We performed our uh, liquid biopsy of the, uh, measuring all the RNAs in the peripheral blood. We are following on that this uh, study haven't uh, finished so far, but we have uh, the initial data. And it's interesting, this is our, the area under a curve to identify uh, those people with coronary calcium uh, in their arteries. And, and you can see that this is an Australian uh, clinical study that we are not very good at all. Uh, we are between 0 0.65 to 0 0.7. Uh, and that's the clinical impression. If we are in front of a patient and we consider they are cardiovascular risk factors, uh, we are far away of really being good, you know, in identifying who has and who hasn't. Now, when we measure the transeptomics on the peripheral blood, all the RNA gene expressions in the way that I showed you, we can see that we can improve that to 0 0.8. So this is a dramatic improvement just with 200 subjects that we enrolled in that clinical study. And again, this is using clinical variables, but also all sorts of uh, RNAs uh, from the peripheral blood. So we are running now uh, another clinical study with 800 subjects. With that, we, were, we, uh, we believe that we will be able to improve these numbers to the point that, that being on a, on, on, on a very good way to predict who has and who hasn't coronary artery disease in a non-invasive way. And interesting, we just started a new clinical study, but in this case, instead of using the plain CT scan, we're going to be using an angio CT scan in order to identify not only the calcium in the arteries, but also the lipid plaque burden that those patients may have. In order to, again, to try to identify, that, identify as early as possible those people at risk of developing coronary artery disease during their life. And that's probably should be when they are under 50 and not when they have a myocardial infarction and they showed up in the emergency, emergency units. So 
I think that this summarizes our approach to the detection of coronary artery disease. Um, we always talk about three dimensions, the universal accessibility, the universal affordability of that. And of course, there should be a universal sustainability of this. So I think that um, in the next, next decade, based on what I have, I have presented to you, we will be able to really um, join this revolution of how to treat and how to identify our patients. Just to finalize, uh, I read this in the Eric Topol's book about AI and medicine a few years ago. Uh, he was discussing about the future of cardiology uh, and, and personalized medicine. I would add two things to this. First, it's not only personalized medicine, it, it's more and more about preventative medicine. We need to really identify very early on who's going to have an event and who is not. And uh, the other thing is that AI is, right now, there are so powerful tools to associate to AI. Genomics is one of them. But wearables, for example, is the other one. So if we can keep combining all that information, all these thousands and thousands of data points and train our algorithms, we're going to be really uh, in front of a new medic medicine that is going to be developed. Thank you very much.